church of Adam or church of Jesus? Which one are we building? Are we building the church of Jesus? Or we are building the church of Adam? That's a very queer topic. But I believe it's relevant. And God will open our eyes to see the kind of church we are raising for him in Jesus' name. Yeah, last night, you remember me sharing with you about hindrances and barriers to the health of local churches. And I said that I summarized everything in three uh, broad headings. That the plan of Satan is to remove three things from every church and starting from the life of every pastor. Number one, he wants to remove the Bible. Number two, he wants to remove the Holy Spirit. And what is number three? He wants to remove prayer from the life and from the church. But I pray over your own life and the work that God has committed into your hand. Every plan of Satan will fail in Jesus' name. Okay. Since 1990, I'm reading the outline now. Or well, thereabout, there have been an upsurge of some crop of preachers that have started churches that I refer to as Church of Edom in our nation and our continent. Before then, the majority of our churches have been following the pattern of Jesus in the Bible. But since then, there have been a gradual shift from the core of Jesus' church to a church that is more Adamic in nature. I want you to underline that word, Adamic, because I'll be referring to it over and over and over again. Adamic in nature. Sadly, most young preachers of today know next to nothing about the church that our Lord Jesus Christ promised to build in Matthew 16, 18, where he said, I will build my church. Most of us young preachers today will know nothing about that church. Almost everyone that has or is newly planting and leading churches is copying the pattern that are referred to derisively as the church of Adam. Now before I interpret what I mean by church of Adam for you, I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you a story. It's a story I've repeated, I've said many, many, many years back. But I need to repeat it for you to understand. And those of you that have not heard it before, heard it for the first time. Because it's a true life story. And it's relevant to our church here. You know, as we do the work of God, the tendency is to shift. The tendency to deviate. The de tendency to copy. This is how everybody is doing it. And you do it like that. And we become a religious center. And the void of the church of Jesus is very high. But I pray as you listen in this conference and as the spirit walk in your heart, in your life, you will come back to the original plan of God in Jesus' name. Many years ago, there was a preacher in Nigeria. He's late now. He died recently, just a couple of years back. But by then, uh, about 15, 20, 30 years ago, he gathers about 10,000 people every weekend to his church. He has a massive place. I won't mention where he is, but it's somewhere in southwest Nigeria here. A massive place. And he has a very strong grace in the area of healing people of uh, mental issues and mental problems. People that have mental issues come to him, and the Lord used him to deliver so many. Mighty miracles were happening. A lot of wonderful and amazing things. Tens of thousands of people do go there. Around 1996, oh no, around 1986, God sent a young boy to him. You know, sometimes when God wants to deal with you, he, will, he wants to humble you of your pride. He will go and send people that are very, very low to you. To give you a message. Where it left for your humility to accept those messages or not. Because you see we human beings. We think of our wealth. Our what? Our class. Our status. So that most of the time. We miss what God is saying to us. Because where we expect God to speak. Is not where it's coming from. God go and speak from a rat. The person you call a rat to. Uh, and that, uh, this one. How old is he? What money does he have? Where has he traveled to? What has he controlled? How many houses has he built? Well, when it comes to God, he doesn't look at all those things. So, somebody he baptized. Somebody he did the naming ceremony for. Somebody he got converted. Somebody that God saved under his ministry. Somebody that God was raising up. Physically and spiritually under him. Was the one God went and sent the message. 
Oh, you know that is biblical. Because can you imagine God sending message to prophet Eli through Samuel? Somebody that is not even up to the age mate of his children. Somebody is teaching how to hear the voice of the Lord. Somebody that when God was speaking, Samuel did not know it was God. He said, Daddy, you are calling me. He said, No, I didn't call you. Second time, yes, sir, you are calling me. He said, No. But from experience, he knew God must be speaking to this young man. So he said, Okay, if you hear that voice again, tell him, Speak, Lord, for thy servant her. It was Eli that taught Samuel that it is God that is talking to you. But it is that person God will go and send a message. God has a way of deflating our pride. Lay your hand on your chest. Every pride in my life. Get out in Jesus name. And what was the message? The young man came and said, yes, sir, I can't say this, but God said, if I don't say it, he will kill me. Yes, sir, the Lord says you are not doing his work. You are doing your own work. I said, shut up! Who told you that one? He said, I'm sorry, sir. It is God who said it. And he has been saying it for a long time. And I said, I won't say it. And he said, if I don't say it, he will kill me. So, as I said, I should tell you that all you are doing is your work, not his work. Of course, he lashed out at him. But six years later, 1991, God came to that preacher and showed him a vision. This was the vision he saw. He said it himself. He saw himself preaching to tens of thousands of people. And while he was preaching, just as I'm preaching to you, he may call you new. Uh -huh. the trumpet sound. And out of those tens of thousands of people, only hundred people went up. He himself was still preaching. And there were about 9,900 people left. He said, as he was wondering, that how can these angels, these angels, sha, they know how to make mistakes. Look at them. They sound a trumpet. Out of all these tens of thousands of people, only hundred went up. This is a grave mistake. He said, as he was thinking that, suddenly he saw Jesus by his side. He said, eh -hem, eh -hem, my Lord, my Lord, tell your angel oh, to resound that trumpet. How can they only pick hundred from all these people? Tell them how to resound this trumpet. He said, and Jesus smiled and said, they did make a mistake. I'm the one that asked them to sound the trumpet. Those hundred that went up belongs to me, Jesus. They are my disciples, people that know me. The rest, 9,900, belongs to you. So find your own heaven for them. I hope that not the voice you will hear on the last day. He said, that's how he woke up. He said, find your own heaven that you are taking them to. Because all these years, you didn't tell them about my heaven. It's as if you have another heaven you are taking them to. So find your own heaven for them. It was then he woke up. And you know when he woke up, he came on radio. You know, there are a lot of things going on that a lot of Christians don't notice. He came on radio and said, don't believe in me, oh. Believe in Jesus. He is the Savior. He is the Savior. Because prior to that time, when people get recovered from their mental issue, allergies, allergies, they come. He only tell them, bring your money. You can keep on going to your Mecca. Jesus is, uh, we are serving the same God. That was what he was preaching. But now when Jesus said, find your own heaven for them, he had to change the message. Now that is illustration of what I want to share with you. Church of Adam, or Church of Jesus. When God gave us the grace, call us, to go and start a church to gather people for him, brethren. Like the team I started last night, we must make sure we are building the church according to Jesus' church. If we are building it by our own, we are simply building the church of Adam. Let's go to the outline. What is an Adam's church? 
Of course, if you read Genesis chapter 5, let's go there. Genesis chapter 5. That's the first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 5. From verse 1 now. From verse 1. Genesis 5 from verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them. And blessed them. And called their name Adam. In the day when they were created. And Adam lived 130 years. And begat a son in his own likeness. After his image, and call his name Seth. Did you hear that? Did you see one truth today? When God created Adam and Eve, He said He created them in the image of God, in the likeness of God. They resemble God. But when Adam was to have his own child, now He gave back to his child after his own likeness, after his own image. Not after the likeness of God. Meaning that everybody that came, we just took the image of Adam. We took the likeness of Adamic nature, the sinful nature, the ungodly nature of Adam. No more the likeness of God. That's why man is a sinner. Not because man sins, but because man is born a sinner. Is the nature of sin in us. He gave back to children after his own likeness. After his own image. And you see when you build church after your own likeness. After your own image. You are building the church of Adam. That's a simple truth there. God created Adam in his likeness. But after falling into sin. Adam began children. After his own sinful image and likeness. Adam sinned principally because he wanted to be like God. If you read Genesis chapter 3. Verse 3 to 7 there. He wants to be like God. He wants to be wise. He wants to know secret things. He wants to be a celebrity. He wants to be like God. That's the deception that, uh, that Satan sold to Eve. And, she, uh, and he took partake of the fruit. Say, so you'll be like the most high. You'll be like God. You'll be wise. And the Bible said, after they take the forbidden fruit and ate, their eyes were open. And they discovered that they were naked. And you know what they did? The Bible says, they went and sow fig leaves and covered their nakedness. That's Genesis 3, 7. That is where religion started from. Human effort to appease God. Before, they didn't know they were naked. Before they didn't know, huh? No, they didn't know. It was after they had the forbidden fruit, they disobeyed. That the Bible said their eye opened and they discovered that they were naked. And what did they do? They went and sow fig leaves and covered themselves. You will discover that when God came, was asking, they said, We hid ourselves. Who told you because we are naked? Who told you you were naked? And you know when God will cover them, He didn't cover them with fig leaves. Went and sacrificed an animal and shed the blood and used the foreskin of the animal to cover them. But that verse 7 is very crucial. Genesis 3 7. They sow fig leaves, cover themselves. That's where religiosity starts from. That's where religion starts from. Hello? Am I talking to somebody? Adam's church, therefore, is a church that is patterned after man's image, after man's sinful nature. After man's religiosity, after man's disobedience and sinful nature. Any church you build that you don't fight sin is a church of Adam. Any church we build on our religiosity, we are religious. Yeah, it's a church of Adam. And can I tell you? Many, many churches are religious today. In fact, we are religious, but we are lost. If you see what we do in church, I will soon enumerate for you. It's religiosity. And you know, when you read your Bible very well, God hates religion. When you are so religious, but you are far from God, 
In your mouth, you profess to know God, but in your actions, you are far from him. It's religiosity. And when you read your Bible over and over again, God hates religion, a form of godliness, but you deny the power thereof. A form of godliness, but you deny the power thereof. I'll get to scriptures for you, but let's move on. So a church of Adam is a church that is built on man's Adamic nature. It's built on man's effort, man's religion to approach God. Because that's religion. It's man's effort to approach God, to please God. And when you are religious, I can assure you, you do many activities, but they are not acceptable to God. You try to please God in your own effort, but it's not acceptable to God. Because that's religion. That's what Adam tried to do. And he built it after himself. Now let's move on. What is Adam's church? A church where the preacher is a celebrity. He wants to be a celebrity. He thinks he's a celebrity. And desire to attract what? Worldly celebrities. Because it is what will make you known. That's church of Adam. He's a popular preacher. He wants to be popular. And wants to walk like the movie stars and the sports stars and the, and, the, and the politicians of this world. We dress like them. We package like them. We are very popular. We believe in our background, where we are coming from, our educational. It's man's attempt to please God. It's a church of Adam. Number two, a church that built by man's educational, social, and class considerations. Yes, it's about class. It's about education. It's about degrees. It's about titles. It's about phonetics. It's about English. It's about all that. It's a church of Adam. It's a church. If you don't have degree, you are not welcome. If your dressing is wrong, you are not welcome. You get to position in such churches by your title, by your age, by your class, by your status. And you can be in position, you can influence it by the power of the money that you can throw around. It's a church of Adam. A church built on the person, the image, and the personality of the preacher. Everybody wants to resemble the preacher. The preacher is more popular than Jesus. It's a church of titles. It's a church of position. It's a church of garments. And living big. And becoming like the movie stars of this world. It's a church of Adam, my brother. It's a church of Adam. You see what Pentecostals are doing? Gradually, we are going back. We are going back to orthodoxy. We are going back. Today, so-called Pentecostals, they go and be ordained as an apostle. I work I'm a worship girl. I've been Pharisee at Sadducee. You see what Pentecostals are doing? We are now wearing robe. Abi, we are even having cap. Keshe rebete yon. Eche obola unle yon. Keshe ye. No, we are putting on. And we are wearing a lot of garments. It's, we are going back to religiosity. Our attempt to please God by our dressing. Our attempt to, to, to bring... That's what Jesus condemned in Matthew 23. The Pharisees and the Sadducees. That they wear long garments. And their hair, they extend the garment. Jesus talked about garment there. And that's what we are going back to. In the name of titles. In the name of position. In the name of ordination. We forget the real life. The life that Christ brought. As the church we are building. Today in some circles. If you don't, in fact in Pentecostal charismatic evangelical circles. If you don't wear dresses. If you are not a bishop. If you are not act pope. Act bishop. Act this. Act that. You are not welcome. It's our religiosity. Yeah the real life of Christ. Is lost there. Hello. Now let me read some Bible passages for you. For you to know that God hates religion. Which many of us are building. And we are building religious people. I will start my Bible passage from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1. You will see there that God hates religion with passion. Even his people. When they became religious, the Israelite. God was rebuking them sharply. He was sending strong messages to them. That I hate religion. Look at it from verse... Uh, from verse 11. Okay. No, no. From verse 10. Look at it from verse 10. Isaiah chapter 1 from verse 10. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. 
do you th who do you think he's talking to? He's talking to the Israelites. No, actual Sodom and Gomorrah. No, he's talking to the Israelites. He's telling them that they are backsliding. They are no more God. They are like uh, the Sodom and Gomorrah that he destroyed in those days. That's what he's saying. Now, verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? The sacrifice, oh. Said the Lord, I'm full of burnt offerings of rams and of fat of fed beasts. And I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of, goat, of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who are required this at your hand to tread my court? You know, you know, part of our religious city, Church of Adam today, we sacrifice today, we do rituals today, we add, this, we add to prayer. You know, in many years ago, God bring water. God used some men of God to, uh, uh, to, to bless water and people receive healing. It's not only water today. Today, there are different kind of water. There are different kind of water. Omi ojo, omi iri, omi okun, omi osa. Omi amu, omi odi, omi opanu, omi owuro, omi oganjo, omi iri. All kinds of waters. Religiosity. Religiosity. That's what the Israelites are doing. We are bringing sacrifices ritual gradually. Especially those of us that are prophetic. Deliverance. Prayer. Miracle ministries. We are gradually sliding back into occultism and bringing what God hates what the blood of Jesus have cancelled what the sacrifice of Jesus have put paid to that's what we are bringing back and that's what the Israelites were doing verse 13 bring no more oblation vain oblation incense is an abomination unto me the new moons and sabbath the calling of assemblies I cannot away with it it is iniquity even the solemn meeting your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hated. They are a trouble unto me. I'm weary to bear them. And when you spread for your hands, I hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your dreams from before my eye. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve your prayers. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together. Say the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Look at all that. They were doing all the sacrifices and all the oblations and all the rituals and the new moons. They observe everything. And yet the Bible says they are doing it in iniquity. Is that not a picture of the church we are building today? Most of the people we put in positions. We bring sacrifice, we bring offering, we bring all that. And yet we are doing it in sin. God says my soul hates that. That's religion. Look at Galatians chapter 1. Okay, I can. Okay, okay. No. Let's jump to Isaiah 58. You see again. Religion. Isaiah chapter 58. You can be religious, but you are lost. You can build a church that is a religious center. That's what I refer to as church of Adam. A religious center where people are religious, but they don't know God. They are religious, but they are lost. Isaiah 58, 1 to 3. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up that voice like a trumpet. And show my people their transgression. And they ask of Jacob their sins. Can you see? These are the people of God. It's the house of Jacob. It's the children of Israel. They say, cry aloud. That's why we are crying. Because somebody must cry. Somebody must shout. Somebody must say and say, look, we are into religion. We are not into God. Verse 2. Yet they seek me daily. And delight to know my ways. And as a nation that do righteousness. And forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take the light in approaching to God. Look at all that. They take the light in approaching to God. But look at verse 3. Wherefore have we fasted? Say they. And thou seest not. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul? And thou takest no knowledge. Why did God not take knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exalt all your labors. Verse 4. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day. To make your voice to be heard on high. 
What's he trying to tell them? That even when you declare a fast, it's to destroy others. Even when you say you are praying, it's so that you can destroy the life of others. You, so that you can smile with a fist of wickedness. That's what religiosity does for you. And when we gather people together, call it church. Just a bunch of religious people. That's what we do there. That's what we do there. Let's move on. You can read the rest. You can read the book of uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. That is Apostle Paul talking about he was religious. He was so religious. He carried religion on his head. And yet he was killing the people of God. And the, another passage says, they, have, they profess that they know God. But in works, they deny him. That's Titus chapter 1 verse number 16. They profess that they know God. But in works, they deny him. If you say, I'm a man of God, I'm a woman of God, I'm building a church for God, how many percentage of your people are living godly lives? What kind of church are we building? Is it a church of where the, the flesh, the works of the flesh, Adamic nature, religiosity, is at display? We build it on our own effort, not on God's power. So an Adamic church is where sin, sinful nature, and evil passions of men are overlooked. In the church of Adam, because it's a religious center, you don't talk about sin. In fact, you overlook sin. You sweep it under the carpet. Could I sing time and We just sweep it under the carpet. Many things are happening that we are sweeping under the carpet. Like one pastor, a young widow, I said the story somewhere recently. A young widow in the church, but she was very wealthy. The husband left her a very good estate. A young widow, less than 40. And the pastor took the widow and started doing combined service with her. And when the elders of the church called the pastor, he said, well, the Bible said Jesus is the husband of the widows. And when nobody has seen Jesus face to face, I am representing Jesus. And the widow loved it. He even gave her a special seat in the church. And his official wife is there. That's church of Adam for you. A church that watch, watch evil and focus only on the positive. Don't let us talk about negative. Don't let us talk about negative. Let's talk about positive. All of us are sinners. If God might iniquity, who shall stand? Let's stop talking about negative. Let's talk about positive. You are a church of Adam. It is negative and positive that brings light. If we don't talk about sin, even where we are still talking sin, sin is overwhelming. Talk less of where we don't talk about sin. I've heard these people say, no mind that Haki John. He's always talking about evil. He's always talking about negative. He's always talking about what we don't do. Yes. Because by telling you, me said they saved myself. So I'll keep saying it. Because that's the way the Bible is built. The Bible talks of positive. The Bible talks of negative. In fact, there was a whole chapter in the message of Jesus. Matthew 23. Jesus used it to rebook church leaders. His church leaders, he rebooked there. Woe unto you, Pharisees and Sadducees. Because you are not going to the kingdom of God. And those who want to go, you block the way. Can it die for you? That's what he said. That's the literal meaning. Because today, many of us that are building Church of Adam, I don't need to go to those kind of conferences. You see, they talk about negative a lot. Where if we don't talk about negative, they will overwhelm all of us. When Jesus came, he talked about it. The apostles talked about it. The Bible was until the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, that said, well, I've been speaking from Genesis chapter 1. If you don't listen, those that are unrighteous, continue. My son for you if you are unholy, continue. But I'm coming quickly and my reward is with me. To give it to every man according as his work shall be. In a church where you don't talk about sin, sin will overwhelm you in that church. It's like taking up your children and you never taught them. You never tell them what is right, what is wrong. What is light, what is darkness. You never taught your children. Everything is okay. Those children will rise up to kill you. It's, the church is like that. A church of Adam is a church of high religiosity, but no spirituality. In relationship with God, we are so religious, but we don't know God. 
It shows in our actions. It shows in our behaviors. It shows in our contact. The fruit of our life shows it. Even among us in that church, we bite each other, we kill each other. It's a church of Adam. A church that does everything to attract the cream, the cream of society. Yes, uh, we want to be able to boast as pastor that I have uh, senators, I have governors, I have uh, all these as my members. Thank God for your life. You know, when we have governors, when we have senators, when we have all those uh, House of Rep, those high government officials as our members, are they born again? I'll be able to change Nigeria with all the people coming to our churches and with all our pastors, big pastors, going for Thanksgiving service of every state, every state you can think of in Nigeria, we go there. What do we preach to them? Is it not to see politicians and blood suckers and tell them, God will promote you. God will bless you. Is that not the gospel we are preaching? So you are so surprised that our nation have not been changed. They say there's no Christian in government. It's a lie. Right from the days of Pastor George, there are Christians in government. Maybe Pastor George said he himself is a pastor. Maybe he started a church. How about Jerry Ghana and so many other top, top government officials? Have we changed Nigeria for better? Because we only build the church of Adam. We have not built the church of Jesus. He said, oh, we build on ourselves, in our own image. In our own likeness. Not in the image of Jesus. That's why, despite the mushrooming of churches, nothing changes. In fact, evil is continuing. And you say some of us should keep quiet. We can't keep quiet. We can't keep, by God's grace, we will not keep quiet. A church where your fashion sense, where your financial strength, where your business acumen are crucial and celebrated. That's a church of Adam. Thank you, sir. A church where the pulpit. Okay. A church where your private, your personal, and your moral life is your what? It's a private affair, so we don't preach about it, too. If you have a deacon that just divorced his wife and married one 18 year old, you don't talk about it. You don't talk about it. If you have a, an elder that just defrauded the government, he was awarded a contract. And he contract uh, in millions and millions and billions. And he never finished the contract. And he just spent the money. Yeah, you don't talk about it. This is his personal business. So long he pays tithe to the church. So long he gave money to the preacher. He's okay. We don't talk about it. It's his private affair. That's a church of Adam, sir. Because this gospel, me, I understand. He covers every area of our life. He covers your marriage. He covers your finance. He's interested in how you make that money and how you are spending that money. This gospel of Jesus, this gospel of Jesus, he's interested in how you use this your body, what you put in and what you put out, how you look, how you think. Hey, it covers every area of our life. But when you run a church of Adam, you don't care. Oh, let's just praise God. Let's give glory to the Lord. The Lord is wonderful. His mercies endure forever. Somebody shout hallelujah. Oh, koko koa jangba de kawasaki susuki. That's all we do. And we think it's acceptable to God. Where when the trumpet sound, like the story I told you, you are going to find it, your own heaven for those people. It's a church where the pulpit is entertaining, celebrating, and it's compromised on scriptural truth. In a church of Adam, the pulpit is never clear. If the pulpit is too strong, they warn the preacher, be careful. You know, so many people have warned me also. If I have problem, I have some problem. I have some problem. I was invited by some churches uh, to come and preach. I thought it's the church of Jesus. So I just went there and was uh, talking. When I look at the face of the host, my host, his eyes were strong. Me said, I know that that is my final message in that church. But I told myself, I may not come another time, but this time, Ah, I must be free from the blood of all men. Me wasu buruku. And what did I tell them? I said that it was in London. It was in London. And I remember one of the churches is in London. It's a church of who is who? Nigerians that are in London. I got to a point. I don't know what came over me. I don't know what came over me. I said, some of you, your wives are back home in Nigeria. And you are here. Sleeping with another woman. 
And some of you, your husband is in Nigeria. You came here on six months visa, visiting visa. And when the visa expire, you go and lobe with another man. And you are doing yala anu abi baba la anu. And your husband is suffering back home and your children. Go back home! You are not serving God. When I look at the pastor, oh, you are <laughs> Me myself knew that I'm in trouble. But you know, within me, I told myself, ah, I have my hotel, I have my ticket, I have everything. So even if he doesn't give me on the road, it's not a problem. I'll get back home. The only thing is don't come back to this church. But let I continue. Why? This one time. And truly, since then, he has never invited me. In fact, he went and told a friend of mine. He's, that one was telling me, telling me recently. He said, he said, hmm, I can almost finish my church. Now, it took him three months to pacify the people. It took him three months to pacify the people. That one said, what did you preach? I said, ah, it is this uh, husband and wife. I've been concerned, you know, new. It is this husband and wife issue. He said, ah, ah. But you preach it in my church. I'm only church it here. I said, your own church is okay. I said, your own church is okay. I said, it's building a celebrity church. A celebrity church. Where your name, your class, your status speak for you. You are a public success, but you are a private failure. That's the church most of us are building. A church where people appear very good outwardly. We are celebrities. Government recognizes us. People on God recognize us. And we go away. We, 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 we make do with all our celebrity status. But privately, we are failures. We are like the movie stars. People who preach through their film. The right life we should live. But they themselves are they are they are they are they are they are they are victims of what they are preaching. They act as a, a perfect marriage, but yeah, they are divorcees and single mothers. People that have children and they don't have a husband. That's the church most of us are building. But let's go to the church of Jesus. Okay, before we go there, let me tell you, there are only three people in this world in terms of Christianity. There are saints, those who are born again. There are sinners, number two. And there is the religious people, number three. There are what? Saints, those who are born again. They know themselves. Oh. There are not many, but they are here. Number two, there are sinners. People are sinners out there. They show by their lifestyle that they don't know God. That they have not accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. There's no fruit of repentance in their lives. They are sinners. They are still fighting God by their works, by their heart, by their thoughts, by their lifestyle. But those ones, we know them. But the most dangerous people are the religious, number three. People do who are neither here nor there. They have works of, uh, they try to say they belong to God, but the fruit of their life shows that they don't know God. And can you believe it? Out of about 52% of Christians in Nigeria, a whole 28% are religious people. If we have 10 born again in Nigeria, oh, 10 people that say they are Christians, about 8 of them are in that number 3. Just religious they mention the name of Jesus, but the fruit of their life doesn't show that they belong to Jesus. They are seen to corruption. They are seen to immorality. They are seen to ungodliness. They lie and they deceive and they do a lot of evil things. And by their lifestyle, people offend God because they say, and you say you are a Christian. And you say you are a believer. How can we build the church of Jesus? Let's look at that. These are the marks of the church of Jesus. So it's your choice. You make a choice. A congregation of those who are called out of sin. Called out from serving Satan and serving idols. That's the church of Jesus. Who, those who have been called out. Called out of sin. Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy lady. And I will give you rest. So any church you build. That is not filled with people that are called out. Called out of sin. If they are not being called out of sin. And you can't sing that song. That's something. Uh, there's a great change. Since I born again. There's a great change. Since I born again. There's a great change. Since I 
since I born again. There's a great change since I born again. Some things I used to do, I do them. It, some things I used to say, I say them no more. Some place I used to go, I go there no more. There's a great change. If your people cannot sing that song heartily, then you are not building his church. The church of Jesus comprised is the congregation, is the assembly of people that have been called out of sin. And it's a personal calling. Because somebody asked a sister, are you born again? She said, yes. How did you know? She said, my pastor told me. That one, that one. They didn't tell me. Nobody told me that I'm born again. I know, I know when it happened. I still remember the incident. I still remember where I got born again. I didn't remember the message. But I remember that when they were preaching, when the preacher was preaching, I know who did the preaching. And he's still alive. I know when he was preaching, it's like somebody gave me a screen. And I was watching all the evils I've done. Even as young as I was, I was just about 16 plus. So, I was remembering the chicken I stole. My, mo my mother's money I stole. And then this one. I mean, the real daddy could just into a show. Jimmy Miller, daddy, who is laughing at me? She be you are worse than me. I was remembering all that as he was preaching. That was what I was remembering. I was hearing what he was saying, but he's just painting the picture of my life. And by the time he said, Let us pray, nobody prayed for me. I just knelt down. I don't remember saying many words. I just said, you know, say I be seen now. With all that I've done, you just have to forgive me today and make me your own. Oh, And he just prayed over it. And you know, when we're coming out of the hall, it's a hall, it's not a local church, it's a fellowship of believers. When we're coming out, I had one experience. It's as if I've been carrying all the luggages of this whole world on my head. Somebody just lifted it up. That was. When I went back to my friends, because I'm from Lawansin, I live in Lawansin area. I live in Lawansin, I carry lay or belay or down. I carry those those my axis when I was young. I play football a lot. Even Stephen Keshi, those who remember, I told we we play in Greater Tomorrow at Sarodin, I carry lay. We play together there. You know when they saw me, I didn't tell them I'm born again. But all the lies, all the jokes, all the morality we do together before, when they do it now, I walk out of there. My soul hates it. And one of them said, Francis, something has happened to you. I said, no. I am the same. He said, you are not the same. You are not the same. You are different from us now. You don't belong to us again. Get out of this place. Because our life doesn't tally with your life now. It was them who said it. I didn't say I am born again. I am a child of God. No, they saw the fruit in my life. Because it was a genuine thing. And all the years I pastored also. People that got born again. I saw them. I've seen Elijah got born again. I've seen Elijah got born again. I've seen people literally transformed by God under my ministry. So I, I know it's not only me. I've seen it happen to people also. And when you preach the truth of God's word and you build a church for Jesus, that's what happened. When you build a religious center, God will not back you up. But when you build a church of Jesus, he will back you up. And you can read on. All those, all those, all those things there. It's meant to show us the kind of church we must build. An assembly of the redeemed, the transformed, and liberated people unto the law. Nobody has access to that name. I am a redeemer of the law. You can be a redeemed church member, and you are not redeemed by the Lord. Churches don't redeem people. It is Jesus that redeemed people. It is the blood of Jesus that redeemed people, that transform people, that change people. And if you don't show that Jesus to people, that he's the savior, he's the sanctifier, he's the coming king, you will be building your own church after your own likeness. The church of Jesus is an assembly of people that live to please God, obey his word in every area of their lives, and they are different in values from the sinners among them. As the church, when you see the real people of God from Genesis, God has always called a people different. Call a people unto himself. A people that are different from the whole world around them. And you know when he called the Israelites out of the land of bondage. And he was taking them to his uh, promised land. He told them in Exodus chapter 19. He said if you live to please me. You will be a peculiar people unto me. 
of all nations of the whole world. Brethren, the church of Jesus is a church of peculiar people. I know we have churches that be peculiar and they are not peculiar to God. It's a people that are different. Different in value, different in lifestyle, different in their choices, different in what they do. Because those are the people he's taking home to himself. The church of Jesus is the bride of Christ that will come and rapture home. I hope you will find your church worthy. I hope you can build a church for him. Now let me close by saying this. According to Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to verse 18. The first Adam sinned. It was the evil that the first Adam did. That the second Adam came to rectify. By disobedience of Adam, he sold everybody into sinful nature. But by the obedience of the last Adam, or the second Adam, he brought us back to God. You know what? The heaven that the first Adam missed is the heaven that the second Adam restored. And if you are a child of the first Adam, or you build a church of the first Adam, you will never get to the heaven of the second Adam. I hope the Lord grant you understanding. So what's your duty as a minister? First and foremost, be a member of that church. Enter through repentance. Enter through godliness. And show fruit of salvation in your life. That's your number one ticket. Number two, everybody that God placed under your leadership. There may be two. There may be three. There may be five. There may be six. Do all you need to do. By prayer. By intercession. By preaching the truth. Sometimes you have to discipline them. Sometimes you have to speak harshly. Sometimes you have to preach in law. But make sure they also are a member of his church. Because you know what? God remains who he is. We can interpret God in many ways. But I love what a professor of mine used to tell us many years ago when I was in my bachelor, bachelor class. That was around 92, 93, 94. Whenever he comes to class, he would give us amazing lectures. Open the Bible before us. You know, when he's closing, he has a way of closing his lecture. He will say, as we are studying the Bible, study the character of God. The first day he said that, I was amazed. I started thinking. I said, is there a difference between Bible knowledge and God's character? I was asking myself. I couldn't find an answer. But this is the way the professor will always close his class. I will go to class three times a week. He has said it for some couple of weeks. So one day again he said it. I said, sir, because the moment he said it, he's on his way out of the class. I said, sir, before you go, sir, I have a question. He said, Francis, what's your question? I said, sir, is there a difference between God's character and Bible knowledge? He said, yes. I said, show me one. He said, never. You are a student of the Bible. Go search it out yourself. I know I took that as a very good challenge. It took me years. It took me a lot of prayers. It took me, in fact, I went and bought a Bible workman. I was reading the Bible. I'll be hearing it in my ears. I have it. I even have it in my iPad till today. I read Bible. I read Bible. But my prayer is, Lord, show me your character. I didn't see it. Professor said there's a difference between Bible knowledge and God's character. Show me. And you know, gradually, God started showing me. God started showing me. I'll tell you one today. I'll tell you one. When God says something, let the whole world change it. God doesn't change. Let, let storm arise. Oh. Let them fall down. Oh. Let them do everything. Oh. He stand by what he says. I discovered that. So when people are shouting, they are going this way. I go and look for God. What are you saying? I would prefer to start where God is saying. Because that noise will go and come down. Shebi is the owner of heaven and earth. We will still come to meet him. Those of you that say, I don't believe in all those gibberish and nonsense. In the speak for now. When you die, he's waiting for you. He won't quarrel with you. Oh, you disobey him today. You do what you like. You build your own church. You destroy his world. You do all those. You hear yeah, yeah, everything. Because you are connected. He will even fight you. He will see a light's rain to fall. His sun to shine on you. 
He will even, he will even not touch your health. You'll be okay. But the day you die, he'll be waiting for you. Another character of God I saw. What he wants to do in 20 years time, he will tell you as if it's tomorrow morning. So if you don't know him very well, you will rush out and rush before your time and rush and rush and rush to destruction. What he wants to do in 20 years time, he will tell you as if it's tomorrow morning. So it is only patient people that can work with God. He will show you a vision. This is where I'm taking you to. Why is he saying that to you? So that you can prepare. So that you can prepare. So that you can prepare. Another God's character. He, will call, he can call you from anywhere. From anything. Call you from sin. Call you from prostitution. Call you from 419. Call you from lying. Call you from drunkenness. Call you from everything. He can call you. But that doesn't mean he approve your life. You are the one now. It's your responsibility to come and make your life to be a vessel unto him to meet his standard. God will never come down to our level. We are the one that must go to his level. Stand up on your feet. So when you build church, build the church of Jesus. Because it is Jesus' church. It's not your church. And he will take his church to his own heaven. You didn't have any evil for anybody.